Good evening, everyone. Happy Feast of the Immaculate Conception to all of you. You know, I can still remember the first time I heard the words Immaculate Conception. I was in second grade in Catholic school, and my teacher showed us kids a cartoon video of the story of Our Lady of Lourdes. In the cartoon, we saw how the Virgin Mary came from heaven and appeared to a little girl named Bernadette in a grotto in France. We saw how Mary prayed the rosary with Bernadette for the conversion of sinners, and she asked Bernadette to have a chapel built on the spot where she appeared. We saw how a miraculous spring of water gushed forth from the very spot in the dirt where Bernadette dug with her hands, despite being teased and jeered at by everybody who looked at her and said she was a fool. At the end of the cartoon, Bernadette asked the lady from heaven what her name was, and the lady responded, I am the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception. I think it was the first time any one of us kids had ever heard those two big, fancy words, Immaculate Conception. Now, Bernadette didn't understand what those words meant when Mary said them to her, and neither did we kids in the second grade at Regina Chaley School in Hyde Park. In fact, I didn't understand what those words meant until many years later. You see, growing up, I always thought the Immaculate Conception referred to Jesus, not Mary. See, I knew enough about my faith to know that Mary conceived Jesus as a virgin. That means that Mary got pregnant with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, not having any relations with the man. You all know that, right? That's what we call the virginal conception of Jesus and the virgin birth of Jesus. And that's what I thought the Immaculate Conception was. And making it all the more confusing was the fact that December 8th, the day that we celebrate the Immaculate Conception, was so close to December 25th, the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, which I thought suggested a connection between the two. And then when you go to Mass on December 8th, you'd hear the Gospel of the Annunciation where the angel Gabriel tells Mary She's about to become pregnant with Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So it was all really confusing. To me, as a kid, Jesus' conception in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit seemed pretty miraculous and pretty clean. And so for many years, I and many of my classmates thought that the Immaculate Conception referred to the virginal conception of Jesus. And you know what? Many adult Catholics, through no fault of their own, think the same thing today. Even Catholics who come to Mass in the Immaculate Conception think that that's what it is. But that's not what the Immaculate Conception is, is it? What I just described to you is what some people call the Immaculate Conception misconception. See, as I later learned, and as hopefully many of you know, and as our kids in Religious Ed at Sacred Heart are going to know, The Immaculate Conception refers to Mary's conception in her mother's womb, not Jesus' conception in Mary's womb. We call it Immaculate because Mary was conceived in her mother's womb without original sin. All of us, when we're conceived in our mother's womb, we have original sin, don't we? Sometimes you think of that like a blotch on the soul, but it's not really that. Original sin means that you don't have something. Original sin means you don't have something inside of you called sanctifying grace. Every one of us in this room, when we were conceived in our mother's womb, we did not have sanctifying grace. When did we get sanctifying grace? On the day of our baptism, exactly. But when Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother, Saint Anne, She had sanctifying grace in her soul. That's why we say she didn't have original sin, because she did have sanctifying grace. 
And that's why the angel Gabriel, when he appeared to her in the gospel we just heard, was able to say to Mary, Hail, full of grace. Because she had sanctifying grace in her soul. That's the first line of the Hail Mary, isn't it? And then after the Annunciation, when Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, she sings a song called the Magnificat. And Mary says, My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Jesus hadn't even been born yet, but Mary was already calling him her Savior because her own son saved her ahead of time. He applied to his mom the merits that he won through his death on the cross even before he died on the cross. And thanks to that, Mary was born without original sin, which is the same thing as saying Mary was born with sanctifying grace in her soul. And that honor that Jesus gave to Mary was so huge, so amazing, so out of this world, that every year on December 8th, all over the world, Catholics go to Mass in honor of the Immaculate Conception. Do any of you wear a miraculous medal around your neck? Very powerful medal to wear for protection and graces. If you look closely at the miraculous medal, the words on the medal describe the mystery of faith that we are celebrating today. On the perimeter of the oval medal, you find the words engraved, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So who does the Immaculate Conception refer to, Jesus or Mary? Mary, don't ever forget it. One of the lessons we can take away from this feast day, besides understanding correctly what the doctrine means, is to never take for granted in our lives the gift that Mary had from the beginning of her life that we have from the day of our baptism. And that's the gift of sanctifying grace. What's the gift, everybody? Sanctifying grace. grace. It's the most precious treasure we have. It's in our soul. On the day of our baptism, you receive this gift when the priest or the deacon pours water over your head. Your soul gets filled with sanctifying grace. And our Catholic faith tells us if we want to go to heaven, and you all want to go to heaven, don't you? One thing you got to do. You got to die with sanctifying grace in your soul. As long as you have sanctifying grace in your soul the day you die, no matter what mistakes you've made in life, you will go to heaven. And that's why, everybody, the day of our baptism and the day of our death are the two most important days of our lives. Because those two days determine where we go for all of eternity. If you're baptized and you get sanctifying grace and you die with sanctifying grace in your soul, you go where everybody wants to go. You go to heaven. And to have sanctifying grace in your soul means that you have the blessed Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, literally living inside of you. If only we understood how awesome this is. The Trinity itself lives inside of us through our baptism. And once we're baptized, Nothing can take away the gift of sanctifying grace from us except one thing. Do you know what it is? What? Sin. So if I steal a grape from the shop, right, do I lose sanctifying grace? Do I? No. That's a venial sin. What takes away sanctifying grace from my soul? Mortal sin. Mortal sin. Mortal sin. Those are the big ones, right? St. John says in his first letter, there's some sins that are deadly, other sins that aren't deadly. There's mortal sins, those are the big ones. They destroy your relationship with God. Venial sins, those are the small ones. They hurt your relationship with God. What are the mortal sins? Murder, having an affair, stealing a large amount of money, having sex outside of marriage, doing serious violence to someone, physically or emotionally, deliberately skipping mass on Sunday or a holy day of obligation, mortal sin. Receiving communion on your tongue without going to confession after you commit a mortal sin is another mortal sin. Those are the common mortal sins. That's what takes sanctifying grace out of our souls. Nobody can take it away from us, and not even a thousand venial sins can take it away from us. Only one mortal sin that we choose takes away from our souls sanctifying grace. Once you lose it, can you get it back, boys and girls? 
How do you do that? By going to confession, exactly. Is there any limit to the number of times you can go to confession after you commit a mortal sin? If you commit a million mortal sins, can you go to confession a million times and receive sanctifying grace back? Yes, you can. That's how huge God's mercy is. As long as there's one spark of sorrow in your heart, there's no limit to the amount of times God can forgive you and put you back in the state of grace. And once you have God's grace back in your soul, you feel peace, you feel good, you feel happy because the Blessed Trinity dwells in you. And just for the record, Mary never had to have sanctifying grace put back into her in confession because Mary never committed a mortal sin. In addition to being conceived without sin, Mary never committed a sin in her entire life, neither a mortal sin or a venial sin. She is the sinless one. I don't have to tell you all that there are many forces in our world at work right now that would like to get all of us and all of you, especially you young people, to do the sorts of things that make you lose sanctifying grace, right? You know, the devil is after three groups in particular. The devil hates priests, the devil hates families, and the devil hates young people, and he's going after us. Our church tells us there are three enemies trying to hurt us at all times, the devil, the flesh, and the world. But those enemies, you got to know, don't be scared. Don't be scared at all. They're no match for the Immaculate Virgin Mary. When you have her on the side, you'll always win the victory. She's queen of heaven, she's queen of earth, she's queen of all the angels and saints. And through her Immaculate Heart, she's always pouring out graces on us to help us obtain victory in the spiritual war that we are all going through down here on earth. All you have to do is turn to her for help. Just cry out to her. Say the Hail Mary. Say her favorite prayer, the Rosary, and she will always give you all the help you need. Even if you lose occasional battles, even if you fall into sin, even mortal sin, with Mary by your side, you'll always win the war. And you'll always make it to your final destination, which is heaven. When Mary appeared to the three children of Fatima, she told them, in the, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. With Mary on your side, you'll always win the war, even if you lose occasional battles. Stay close to her your whole life long. So as we honor Mary's immaculate conception today, let's thank God for giving us, on the day of our baptism, the same gift he gave to Mary on the day of her conception. What was that gift? Sanctifying grace. And on this great solemnity, let's ask Mary to help us to stay in the state of sanctifying grace, now, always, and especially at the hour of our death. And together, let us say to Mary, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Amen.